Good morning. A guy named uh, Ed Wharton taught a class on Galatians in either 1980 or 81, I believe, at sunset. And um, Ken Stegall pointed me to that class uh, some years back. And uh, I listened through, I sat through the audio of the whole thing, and it was on CD, but it had been recorded on cassette tapes, okay? And so you can imagine, like, the sound quality is just abysmal, okay? And um, through those muffled recordings, um, I heard some really, really superb teaching. And so this morning, I want to kind of work on some of the bones of a few, maybe an argument or two in that, in that class, and hopefully that'll be helpful today as we study. If you were in Jerusalem <clears throat> in the first part of the, the first century, A.D., he is likely the scariest person you know. He is relatively famous. He is fanatical. He is feared, certainly. Saul of Tarsus, as the Apostle Paul was known in Jewish circles, is a terrifying figure. There are few people in the Bible that we actually know more about. Uh, We have so much of Paul's life. We have his background, obviously, his writings. And, you know, you look around for somebody to compare him to in modern times, right? Um, You look for a modern contemporary, and honestly, he is so... He is so singular, so unusual, that it's tough to, to find even one. And it's a little bit risky, but the one I keep coming back to that I can't get away from, it's Osama bin Laden. Hold, hold with me. Um, bin Laden was smart. He is wealthy. If you didn't know it, his dad was actually a billionaire. Uh, He is devout. He is connected. By every account that we have, he was extremely charismatic. And he was focused to the point of obsession on this thing that he called jihad, uh, this coming holy war. And he had very large aspirations for killing in that war. And in a big part of the world even now, bin Laden is viewed positively because he righteously did God's work by killing infidels in God's name. And that's exactly what Saul of Tarsus thought, thought he was doing. We learned about Saul through a couple different channels. Uh, we're going to be bouncing kind of mostly around Acts today. And in Acts, Luke uh, gives us a lot about him, especially in chapter 9. And Luke actually records some interesting chapters where Paul himself will tell his own story, kind of long form, a couple of times, uh, especially I'm thinking of Acts 22, uh, to a mob that is literally trying to tear him limb from limb, no pressure, and Acts 26, where he ends up in this Roman courtroom, and you know it's stuffed with politicians and muckety-mucks and even this, this visiting client king kind of guy. Uh, in, in his letters, Paul will sprinkle some, some snippets about his life and his conversion. And his conversion is a wild story. But to us, it's not really that way at all, is it? It's sort of normal. This, this person is normal. And we didn't know him before Damascus. And importantly, we did not fear him before Damascus. And so the person that emerges from Damascus is, uh, is not that scary to us. And he's just the good old Paul that we know. But in antiquity, the people that heard this story were absolutely floored by it. Saul, or uh, Shaul would have been his Hebrew name, uh, he'll come to be known more widely by his Latin name, Paulus. He was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, and that's modern-day southeastern Turkey, uh, probably to a prominent family. We're not really sure. There is some thought out there that the family is actually related to Herod the Great, of all people. Um, we do know that they are devout Jews. And 
He's at least middle class or better. He may have been well off. We're not sure. At least he appears that way later on. You'll remember that he appears before a Roman politician. And he keeps having him in to preach because he's fishing from a, for a bribe from him, right? And the thing is about bribes uh, is that you don't try to solicit bribes from people that are destitute, poor people, because you gen generally don't get much, okay? So he may have appeared like he was well off. All right, so he's born up in Cilicia, but he is actually brought up in Jerusalem, and he's educated down there. He studies under this guy named Gamaliel the Elder, really famous rabbi. He is the grandson of an even more famous rabbi. Have you guys heard of Hillel the Elder? That's his granddaddy. Paul says later of his schooling that he was thoroughly trained in the law, which is like the understatement of the century. Um, to get a seat in front of a rabbi like Gamaliel, Paul or Saul at that time would have been on the extreme, like far right end tail of the bell curve. You know what I mean? Like this guy was smart. Go read Romans. I mean, it's, it's a master class in literature and, and, and reason and, and theology and all the rest. And this guy, Saul, is, is on the partner track. He's going to be somebody. There are hints that cause us to wonder if he's, if he's already well-known, like pre-conversion when he's young. He says later uh, that he is, uh, every, every Jew knows, he says, every Jew knows how I've lived since I was a little kid in both Tarsus and Jerusalem. He was apparently known. In Galatians chapter 1, he'll say that he was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my own people. This is a rising star kind of dude, okay? Ideologically, he's a Pharisee. We've talked about them a lot in the, fa in the past. I feel like every Sunday I, I preach is about Pharisees now. I don't know why. Um, these guys are strict, and they have traditions that fence in traditions, that hedge in other traditions, that hold in traditions that, that skirt the actual law of Moses it, it, itself. In Acts 23, Paul will say he's a Pharisee from a long line of Pharisees. He describes himself as extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. And people I've read actually think he's not talking about the law of Moses there. He's talking about the traditions of his pharisaical fathers. This guy's a total ideologue. He evidently made your Joe Pharisee just look totally tame. And it's just about unthinkable that he would entertain and look at some other religion outside Judaism favorably, okay? And I actually think he's saying that he is so prejudiced that he wouldn't even entertain another flavor of Judaism. Like, I don't think you could have talked this guy into being a Sadducee or an Essene or any of the rest of it, okay? Saul is, at this point in his young life, a well-bred connected, possibly moneyed, uh, very intelligent and highly educated, well-known, zealously religious bigot. Saul's a guy that knows what he is going to be when he grows up. He has always known that. This is your most likely to succeed guy in Torah school. I think, look, I, I can't really prove this, but I think this guy will be on the Sanhedrin someday. I think that's where he's headed. I think it's inescapable. Like, I think that's where he's going. Does Saul sound like to you, does he sound like someone that will deviate for the course that he has set for his life? Does he look like somebody that's going to jump the tracks? He doesn't. This guy's never going to deviate from what he's decided for himself, in his life. And this is who shows up in Acts 7, outside the walls of Jerusalem, as Luke says in verse 58, that a crowd, an incensed mob, drags a man named Stephen outside the city, and Saul follows them, and um, he's trustworthy enough to watch the fancy clothes of the people that murder Stephen. And he witnessed a gruesome, slow death with an innocent man yelling something about the Son of Man and the glory of God. And as he was hit repeatedly, stone after stone after rock, until he was dead, 
And we're not sure why this young man doesn't participate, but he was likely close enough to see blood spatter. Chapter 8, verse 1 says simply that Saul approved of their killing him, of Stephen. He didn't bat an eye, and he thought this was great. Verse 1 continues, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. It was like a dam broke. The persecution is so bad that it washes pretty much everybody that's not an apostle right out of the city of Jerusalem. Godly men, verse 2, buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged up off both men and women and put them in prison. So he doesn't help murder Stephen for whatever reason, but Saul decides to get involved right afterwards and in a big, big way. Some versions translate destroy as laid waste. You may have that in verse 3. Uh, the, it, the, the meaning here is to injure severely. The church in Jerusalem is on, is on life support. It is in critical condition from the actions of one man. Saul is breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. This is Acts 9 verse 1. And we start to get a picture of a man that is not at all normal. Saul of Tarsus persecutes this new religious group. They call it the Way, starting on the day that Stephen dies, and he goes way, way too far. He is dragging moms and dads out of houses into streets and leaving their children as orphans. He's an equal opportunity killer. Luke has, has a way with words, and he says that Paul is breathing out murderous threats. The, the threats and the death and the violence and the destruction just comes out of this guy like the airy breeze. It's like a black cloud. At some point, he is satisfied with the work that he has done in Jerusalem, and he does something, again, that normal people just don't do. He's, he decides to take this show on the road. And Acts 9 tells us that he went to the high priest, he asked him for letters to the synagogues, plural, in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, again, Christians, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now look, if you want to hunt Christians, there are lots of places to do that in and around Jerusalem that are a whole lot closer than Damascus. Damascus way up north in Syria, okay? And so the text indicates that Damascus is not his first field trip. This is a different kind of person than someone who is just really into like law and order, like an enthusiastic district uh, attorney or something. And he's not just looking to, to hang really, you know, thick prison sentences on people. He wanted every last one of these infidels dead and buried. Do you see what he is? Saul's a terrorist. In the most basic sense, he uses fear as a means of coercion. It's almost exactly the, de the dictionary definition of terrorism. He's a terrorist. So he goes to the high priest to get these letters, and he gets them, and we don't care much about that because that doesn't mean much to us. But let me think about that. Let's just, let's just talk about that a little bit. Uh, the high priest himself, he's a big deal. He knows Saul personally. And he not only knows him or of him, he trusts him. And he trusts him enough to give him authority. Really powerful authority. And so, like, let, let's just bring it forward to, to modern times. Me and you, we can't go to Washington, D.C. this week and get this kind of authority, okay? Now, you know, why? Well, I mean, there's lots of reasons. Uh, I, I, I can't speak for you, but... I don't know anybody in Washington, D.C. I don't think I could get a meeting with anybody that mattered at all. I don't have any clout. I don't have any pull in that city. I don't make any political contributions. I am a complete nobody in that town. Saul of Tarsus, the Hebrew of Hebrews, he'll call himself later, the Pharisee of Pharisees, is anything but a complete nobody. And he goes into the high priest 
And he gets that authority. Not just anybody off the street does that. Saul does. Even powerful men, though, you know, they get distracted after a while, and they get bored, and they move on to new pursuits and new hobbies, new flings. Not Saul of Tarsus. He will tell King Agrippa later on what drove him, and this is found in Acts 26. He says that, <laughs> I was so obsessed, verse 11, with persecuting Christians that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. That is cities, plural. The man has an obsession. And that's something that if you, if you want to stop, you, you kind of can't. Saul is never going to quit hunting Christians ever. Ever. It can't be bargained with. It can be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. And it absolutely will not stop ever until you are dead. Who knows where that's from? Nobody? Man, it's from the Terminator. But that, I mean, it's about a machine that's bent on killing, okay? But that's exactly what Saul reminds me of right here. He's never going to stop until every last one of these people are dead. And he doesn't care where you live. He's coming for you. And he's going to drag you out of your house. And he's going to drag you and your wife out. There's a, there's a whole lot more. I mean, you could say just a ton about Saul, but when you piece all these things together, they form a picture, and it's sort of a mosaic, and it's of a man that is unconvertible. He's unreachable. Question. <laughs> does, does Saul, as we've described him, does he, does he sound like a person that you just waltz up to with a pocket New Testament and a smile and try to rope into a Bible study? Really? Would you risk it? Hey, bro hey Saul. How you doing today, brother? Family good? Yeah? Look, I think Jesus Christ is the answer for you. Jesus of Nazareth has something for you. We need to talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's get something on the calendar. How about next Tuesday? Are you serious? This guy would try to strangle you with his bare hands, or at least have his goons do it. Would you risk it? Would anybody in the first century risk it? Paul will share his mindset during the period in Acts 26, and I think it's really interesting that we actually have what he's thinking at the time. Uh, he's, <laughs> he, he says this, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. How then do you convert that guy to Jesus of Nazareth? And the quick answer is, you don't. Because you can't. Now, before you misunderstand, because the, you know, it's easy to do here, we're not taking anything away from the power of the gospel. We are not taking anything away from the power of God to change hearts and minds. But there are some people in this world that are not reachable. They are not convertible with the gospel. Now, you can agree with that or not, but why is that? I think it's true. Why is that? It's because they decided to be. They have made themselves unreachable. Yes? I, I saw an interview one time... Um, with a really famous atheist, and the, he's near death, he's just eat up with cancer. And the guy interviewing him asked him, he says, you know, like, what do you make of these reports that come out about these, uh, these really famous atheists? And nearly all of them, it'll come out later, two weeks later, that they converted to Christianity or whatever. And the guy, the famous atheist, just smiles, and he shakes his head, and he said, don't believe it. If you hear that about me, it was the drugs, it was the pain, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Some people are unreachable by the gospel. Why? Because they've decided to make themselves unreachable. And I think Saul's one of these people. 
Now, look, I just told you this guy can't be converted. There's no way. Absolutely unreachable. And the awkward part of this is that I think every, just about everybody knows in here that he actually was converted, so I've got to do some explaining. You probably have heard the story, what, a hundred thousand times? I don't know. At least a thousand. Saul heads north to Syria. He is not alone. He takes some muscle with him to do, you know, some roughing up. It is a sunny day. It's about lunchtime, and they're almost there. It's dusty. They're tired. They've been gone a long time, but they can almost see the city just ahead of them, okay? And in a matter of hours, Saul will have his goons start dragging people into what will be their last few days or weeks on earth. They will be marched in chains back to Jerusalem where they will be given a perfunctory trial and they will be executed. But what had happened so many times in Jerusalem and, and thereabouts, it doesn't happen that day in Damascus. There is a light. And apparently its intensity makes the sun look like a nightlight and everybody hits the ground. Saul, everybody around him. It seems like the thing to do at the moment. And he can't see much. But he can see him. Now he doesn't know how. If it's with, you know, in, his, in his mind, if it's in his eyes, he doesn't know how, but he sees him. And this person that he sees begins speaking to him. He calls him by name and he's speaking to him in his mother tongue in Aramaic. And I'm paraphrasing, but he basically says, why are you hurting me? It's hard on you to do what you're doing. Why are you hurting me? And Paul, much later, will continue that story. He will say, Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? And the answer comes back, and it is not what he expects. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Now get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. That for me has got to be the biggest oops moment in the Bible. Saul is kind of the ultimate in self-assurance. So if you're, if you're killing people in the name of religion, you're sort of by definition not having any moral quandaries about what you're doing, okay? Um, <laughs> and Saul gets the shock of his young life when he figures out that he has been murdering people that the Lord loved and that the Lord has taken it personally and is here to do something about it. And he's been on the wrong side and he didn't know it. And, and face down in that road, he starts wondering how in the world he has been so blind. And about that time, the Lord strikes him blind. Verse 8, Acts 9, Saul got up from the ground. but When he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. His enforcers become his babysitters at this point. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Three days without seeing a thing with his eyes. But I reckon, I reckon he saw plenty with his eyes. I don't know what he saw. Did he see faces? Did he see the, the terrified and confused men and women and children? I, I don't know. He saw something. And for three days he gets to marinate in how he's lived his life thus far. 72 straight hours. Not a drop of water, not a scrap of bread, not an olive. And apparently... Saul does nothing but pray for the duration. There's a, uh, there's a local guy there in Damascus, and uh, the Bible says that he is a, um, he's a disciple, and he's a, a, a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. This is a good guy. His name is Ananias, and Jesus decides to appear to him as well. And uh, you can kind of imagine that conversation, right? Lord, what do you need? What do you got? What do you got for me? Anything you want. And the Lord says, yeah, I need you to swing by uh, Straight Street and go check on Saul of Tarsus because he's in town. And Ananias goes, I'm sorry? <laughs> Saul is so feared at this point. Remember, we're not even close to Jerusalem. We're way up north in Syria. Saul is so feared, 
that Ananias feels it necessary to tell Jesus Christ how dangerous this fellow is. Lord, you should know. I've heard things. This guy, bad dude. Bad dude? He basically says, I don't want to go. The Lord says, you're going. And Jesus ends the conversation by saying, I will show him, Saul, how much he must suffer for my name, which should make the hair on the back of your neck stand straight up. Luke records Ananias telling Saul specifically why he's there, because he does go there. Number one, to fix his sight. Number two, to get him the Holy Spirit, ostensibly through baptism. He does lay his, his hands on him, and these scales, things fall off, and he can see again. Now, look, huh. You can agree with this or not, but Ananias does not educate him. Go read it. He does not preach the gospel to Saul. Now that, for some reason, has been a long-held tradition of ours. Now, look, before, I know at least one of you wants to roast me on a spit for that, but before that happens, um, I, I don't have... I don't have much right or authority to make that claim and to make a big deal about that. I know who does, though. Paul does. And in Galatians, specifically, uh, specifically chapter 1, Paul vehemently refutes the claim that some guy, actually any guy, any human, taught him the gospel. More on that in just a minute. Ananias heals him. He baptizes him. It specifically says, in order to wash away his sins, if you want a primer on what baptism does, what it's for, when it works, what happens, that's a great place to start. And he relays some really interesting, important messages to him. In 22.14 of Acts, Ananias says that God has chosen you to know his will. You're going to know what he thinks. You're going to know what his plans are. You're going to see the righteous one, meaning the Messiah, Jesus. You're going to hear words from his mouth. He will be in communication to you. He's going to tell you what to do. And you're going to be a witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. Past tense. Already seen and heard from who? From Jesus. Sounds apostolic, does it not? Well, there's a good reason, because now he's an apostle. Saul gets some food. It takes him a while, but he recovers. Following his kind of trail through the rest of Acts 9, picking up in, in verse 19, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished, I'll bet, and asked isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on this name? And he asked, and he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests. And yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled. You may have confounded the Jews. Baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. This is where it gets really interesting for me. From the text, how long is it before Saul rolls into a synagogue and starts preaching Jesus Christ crucified. How long? How long? Brethren, it's a matter of days. I guess it can't be less than three. But how long is it? Is it five? Is it seven? Is it ten? It's days. Saul wielded a focus and, and an intellect, just <laughs> luminously brilliant mind. And an obsessive, and I would say almost addictive personality. He could debate, and he could reason, and he could persuade like nobody else. And God decides to give a guy like that, with that sort of weaponry, a big old dollop of the Holy Spirit and an apostolic charge. And Saul takes those gifts, and he shows up in local synagogues and begins annihilating people that line up to debate him. Can you imagine facing off against that guy? I bet he was all 31 flavors. Would you want to handle that guy in a debate? I bet he was a handful. He proves, it says, that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, question for you. Does that sound like 
He is working on his gospel. Is he perfecting his gospel? It doesn't. And that's, that's his point in Galatians. Look, now I know it probably doesn't sound like it, but it, it does actually take some time to get some material ready to preach, um, some more than others. But Saul's not figuring out his doctrine here. And he's not figuring out what he should preach. And he is certainly not asking the other apostles what they think. He actually makes that specific point in Galatians. He had, I'm kind of being silly, but he didn't borrow a New Testament from, Testament from somebody and, and flip through it and see what's there. He did not attend seminary. He did not go to preacher school. And again, I'm, I'm sort of being facetious, but that's the claim that's made in Galatians about him. This was your worst enemy last week. He's Osama bin Laden 10 days ago. This week, Ken Stegall. Take your pick. You pick your preacher. He turned on a dime. He turned on a dime. The, the change is so shocking and so immediate that there's discussion in Damascus as to whether it's the same guy that came up from Jerusalem or not. And that makes a whole lot of sense. Like, I, I'm going to get the year wrong here, but uh, what if U.S. military intelligence in 2003 gets credible reports of Osama bin Laden preaching Christ crucified in mosques all over Karachi, Pakistan, what would they think? What would we think? It just can't be him. There's no way. It's got to be like a body double or something, right? It just can't. It can't be. Because it's impossible, right? These guys are known quantities. Fanatics like this. Terrorists are known quantities. Zebras don't change their stripes. Or is it spots? I can't remember. There's a spots, there's a stripes. But, but people don't change. We know that. It's because people are made a certain way. And people that are committed to an ideological you know, thing, they don't change on a dime. They don't, they don't turn quickly. It takes years to do this sort of thing. And this guy, a week later, come on. Paul says that years later that the report goes out the, at this time, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praised God because of me, and I'll bet they did. And we get to see, if we'll just look, just how stunning that conversion is to the people at the time, living at the time. It would have been huge news, and it would have been a huge relief Paul says it, it's something the church praised God for. How did it happen? Well, Paul will explain that in Galatians chapter 1. This is verse 11. Really interesting section of scripture. I mean, I wish I had more time with it. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, he says, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. And real quick, if you have the true gospel, anybody in here can say exactly that, just like Paul did. If you have the true gospel, it is not from humans. It is of divine origin. Everybody can say that. The next sentence, not so much. You can't say this one. Verse 12, I did not receive it from any man. I didn't find it in some clay jar in a cave. I didn't get mailed a book. I didn't, didn't see a video. Didn't get it from anybody. Nor was I taught it. Again, I didn't go to seminary. I didn't go to preacher school. Nobody sat me down for a Bible study. How in the world then would you get your gospel, Paul? I received it, he says, by revelation from Jesus Christ. Now that is a whopper of a sentence. And almost universally ignored. How is he able to preach immediately in Damascus? Well, it's because of a revelation. That word, again, you could take a lot of time with this. I don't have a lot of time. It's where we get the word apocalypse. And it has to do with an uncovering. And the idea is you've got something covered over like with a sheet or a tarp or whatever, a canvas. Maybe it's a big statue or a sculpture or something that, that's about to be unveiled. And, you know, the artist does this and a guy pulls a rope and what happens? The sheet comes off, right? And everybody oohs and ahs. That's Revelation. It's an uncovering. You couldn't see it before, and now you can. And it happens like that. It doesn't take a lot of time. 
Paul says that Jesus Christ revealed the gospel that he is now preaching. He knew what he knew, I believe, immediately. The Bible says after many days, again, we're still in days. It doesn't say months, doesn't say years. Days. In Damascus, there's, there's a conspiracy to kill Saul. Uh, you know, it's kind of darkly comical. Like, you forget just how many people tried to kill this guy. I mean, it's like every other week, somebody's trying to assassinate you. Hey, he, he, you, either, you either convert or you try to knock him off. This is the first time. You'll remember he's lowered over the wall in a basket. You had that on your bingo card. That's an unusual one. He runs. He, he, he flees. And he goes to Jerusalem. This is 926 of Acts. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him. Not believing that he really was a disciple. All the Christians in Jerusalem think it's a trap. And we would too. The guy that just a couple of weeks maybe ago dragged off your friends and your family and they're dead and he wants to come to church with you? We would not believe that and they didn't either. You remember that Barnabas has to actually come in there physically and vouch for him. But the point being that nobody, even the apostles in Jerusalem, thought this was even possible. Nobody believed it because it was crazy. Speaking of that word, uh, I, I do want to throw in one last reaction to Saul because it's important later. You know what? He's really smart. Everybody knows that. And he believes what he's telling people, obviously. Paul's crazy. That's what it is. He's nuts. And that actually comes out in Acts 26 where Paul appears on trial before Agrippa and this guy named, this Roman named Portius Festus. And uh, they let Paul kind of run through his story, run through his conversion and... Um, his teaching, and finally, this guy Festus just cannot take it anymore, and he just starts shouting at Paul. Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning has driven you insane. Like, you've got so much stuffed up in that big brain, it's just turned to oatmeal. It's turned to mayonnaise and noodles, like my daughter says. It, it's just mush up there. And Paul's very calm, and he's very polite, and he says, I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not insane. I'm not crazy. And he says something really interesting. He says, what I'm saying is true, and it's reasonable. And I think that's really interesting. He says, all this is true. And beyond that, though, if you had seen, if any reasonable person had seen what I've seen, and you've done what I've done, you've experienced what I've experienced, you would have believed the exact same thing I did. It's all true. And beyond that, it's reasonable. I'm not crazy. Fanatical, all right, you know, obsessed, okay, he got me there. But he's lucid, he's not crazy. Wrapping this up, uh, we, me and you, we, we, we tend to look just about anywhere for ways to strengthen and ways to affirm our faith. And we pour over the Bible and we'll, we'll read books and we'll watch shows and, and we'll listen to music or podcasts or sermons or whatever. And, and we'll, we'll look for providence. We'll look at, at how God has acted in our lives and, and we'll look for connections and links and threads. And all that's great. All that's excellent. We should keep doing that. But somehow we have managed to overlook one of the most underrated arguments in the Bible. And it's an argument that uses what we know about human beings, how we're built how we act, and how we change. When, when he describes his younger self, Paul will describe a person that is impossible to convert. And yet he is converted. How do we know Paul saw Jesus? And that his gospel and everything he wrote is true and complete and real and, and authoritative. Well, it's because of fanatical, hyper-religious, anti-Christian, mass killer turned on his heel to not only stop persecuting this way, but to enthusiastically and wholeheartedly follow Jesus. That's how we know. We can know what happened in the dust just outside Damascus really happened and that Paul saw exactly what he did and he saw exactly who he said he did. And he got the one true gospel from the source. 
And that has real world implications for us even now because Paul is going to teach some really hard, sometimes very uncomfortable things that the modern ear does not want to hear. Paul will go on to write half the books in the New Testament. By volume, he writes something a little bit over a quarter of it. And via a penitent murderer, God gives us some of the most beloved and beautiful verses in the entire Bible. I've been crucified with Christ. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. If I have a faith that can move mountains and don't have love, I'm nothing. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I press on toward the goal. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Put on the full armor of God. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Chances are you're going to read Paul or you're going to read about Paul this week. That person that you're reading, he is an impossibility. He almost literally cannot be there. He almost literally cannot exist. And yet there he stands. We should let Paul convince us, just like he convinced people in his day, who he was, what he saw, how he got the message he preached. And, it, and if we'll do that, we'll be convinced, just like the people of Paul's time were. It's all true. And even beyond that, it's reasonable. If you have a need that can be met with a, a public response this morning, won't you come while we stand and sing?